morning, everybody. While we're waiting for that, let me just say by introduction that the idea for this session was Donald the Butler's, as is frequently the case. And the association between Donald and myself and fiscal policy go back a long time to when I was in the tax forecasting section of the Department of Finance and he was in the Revenue Commissioner's. So then I did the top down, he did the bottom up, and it's the same today because I'm going to have a sort of a broad overview and Donald will follow with the real stuff in a few minutes. Now, um, coming back to fiscal policy and budgetary policy after an absence of a few years when I just took a break from it, I was astonished to find how complex it had become. I read a thing called the Vada Makem twice. I still don't fully understand it, and it gave me a headache. Um, and you saw earlier from the presentations by the two Michaels, Michael McGrath and Michael Tully, I think echoes of this. It is just now incredibly complex. In fact, probably vastly overcomplicated. Um, be that as it may, I want to run through a few things, and I'm, there may be a small element of repetition here, but that probably is no harm. I'm going to start with this slide. And now it's a table. You may not all be able to see it, uh, and I just want to pick out a few points out of it. The first, this is from the strategy for growth document produced by the Department of Finance before Christmas. Uh, that document has been criticized as short on analysis and long on aspirations, but this, th these are the figures underlying it, and they provide a useful framework for, for, today, for my purposes today. The first thing is the budget deficit. You will see that in 2015, when the fiscal austerity program ends, it's at 3% or 2.9, depending on the figures as, you, as they round. Uh, but you will see that it goes then, continues in subsequent years, and in 2018, it eventually goes into surplus, small surplus. So let's say it breaks even in 2018. Uh, so in other words, the implication of that is um, we have one more tough budget, for sure, but then something else has to happen after 2015 to get us back to balance, right? That's the first point. Um, the primary balance, which is the deficit excluding interest, uh, is in a, apparently better shape. It's going, gone to zero this year. That's all I'd say about that. Now, the output gap, which was referred to earlier, and I suppose I'll give you my definition of, of, of the output gap. Uh, well, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the difference between where the economy is now and where it would be in an equilibrium state, if we want to think of it like that. Um, it's actually roughly around zero this year as well, according to these forecasts. Now, the output gap, um, part of finance used, for some strange reason, the last budget was missing a, a chunk of forecasts that we have all become accustomed to, uh, which included things like the output gap, and without which it's impossible to analyse the budget. But... Um, uh, it, the, when they used to publish it, they used to put in, it's in this SGP, that's the stability, SPU, Stability Program Update, I beg your pardon. Um, and uh, there's quite a bit on it there. Uh, they used to put a health warning in, which has been commented on earlier by a number of people, including Donald Lund from the audience, who cited the 2078 experience when it was revised by eight percentage points. Uh, the, the deficit was revised by that much. Um, and this happened by both the EU and the IMF. Uh, and uh, um, Klaus Regling was here the other day. He didn't want to hear about things like that. You know, it's very easy to revise your view of history and have a simple view that Irish fiscal policy was pro-cyclical. Depending on how you look at it, it wasn't that pro-cyclical at all, perhaps marginally so in some years. Um, but anyway, the output gap uh, is zero, which means the economy is sort of in equilibrium, which is not a sentiment I think a lot of people in the audience would subscribe to at the moment uh, in 2014. So that's another illustration of the difficulties with that concept, on which a lot of this stuff hinges, let me, let me say. Um, structural budget balance. In 2015, it's still at 3%, and it only goes to zero in 18. That's an important milestone. And again, I'd be coming back to how do we get from three to zero? Is it more austerity? Or what? It's not austerity in the sense that we become used to, but something has to happen to get down from three to zero. Um, now, interest as a percentage of GDP peaks at five percent. Uh, that's interest on the debt, and then begins to taper off, which is a help in the future. Um, the implicit interest rate rises to about four and a half percent. That's the interest, that's the the debt co service cost of this year's borrowings as a percentage of last year's debt. Right. So it peaks around four point four percent there and stays there for the foreseeable future. And the last two ones are important there, nominal GDP growth. If the economy grows, this becomes easy. That's what happened in the 80s. We got massive growth and our debt fell as a percent of GDP. By the way, a word on debt. You know, this came up last night. I, I hear people saying, we never pay down the debt. Our children will be burdened forever. I looked at a number of countries. Countries don't pay down debt, hardly ever. The exceptions, even the UK, when they hit North Sea Isle, only had a few years of debt pay down. Norway did, and I was told last night Singapore did. 
But otherwise, what they do is they reduce the debt, as a, they leave the debt constant, and it declines as a percentage of national income. And so that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about, you know, as you would your mortgage, going back and paying it off in increments. Governments simply don't do that. So um, nominal GDP growth is therefore important if we want to reduce the debt as a percentage, which is where the action is at. And you can see there in those forecasts, nominal GDP growth gets up to over 5%. Uh, there are two components to that. There's growth of three and, and a bit, three to three and a bit, and there's inflation between one and two. It eventually gets up to about two percent. And um, some people think that's an optimistic enough forecast, and I have more to say on that and none. But the key thing is the interaction between that and the the interest rate on the debt. Once the two become even, your things are getting better. And once the growth, nominal terms, exceeds interest, you're laughing. Let me think. Put it like this. If debt is 100% of GDP, the interest rate is 4%, and your growth is 4%, then debt will stay constant at 100% of GDP forever, sine idea. Once the, the nominal growth goes above that, it begins to fall as a percentage. That's my simple explanation of that. And you can see the effect on debt in the final line. It peaks at 124% in 2013. By 2018, it's down at 104. Well, by 16, it's down at 115. That reduction largely reflects the use of balances built up by the NTMA, which will you know, be diluted over time. But thereafter, it's the growth effect that kicks in. The fact that the growth is higher than the interest begins to lower the debt. OK, enough of that. Um, what has changed? This is this fiscal semester, uh, and you heard this earlier. For me, a couple of things on this have changed. Well, the bud in April, as usual, we get the stability program update. That hasn't changed. Uh, move along then, the, the big change here, I suppose, in June you get the memo to government planning the next budget. That hasn't changed. In October is the first change, really. This is the pink bit. The pink bits are the changes, where you now get a budget in October. You get input from IFAC. It goes to the commission, as you were told earlier. The commission may have uh, observations on it. And in December you get what is then the real budget, or the finance bill, or at least that's the way it's teed up to be. In our, we're used to the budget being done on night of introduction, but this, in theory, at least, is the change. You will have a draft budget in October and a final budget in December. What were the changes in the SGP in 2011 and 12? I thought I'd resume them briefly here. Um, the dark stuff is the change. There's a new expenditure benchmark, which is going to be critical, right? And I think that's, in a way, is the, the driving factor of all of the various caps and restrictions and limits and targets that we had earlier, my thesis today will be, if we hit the expenditure benchmark, the rest will more or less fall into line. So that's important. The two-pack enhanced surveillance, you were told about that. The, um, the, 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 the benchmarks here were tightened. Uh, minus half percent, that's the pace at which you move into balance. Minus a half percent if debt is greater than 60% or less than half percent if debt is way below 60% and there are uh, low risks. <coughs> now, another thing of the, 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 the stability on convergence and wherever it's called, uh, I have to ask Alan Jukes, or otherwise known as the fiscal compact, uh, it put into our constitution, <coughs> to our basic law, all of these rules. And that's an important change. And finally then, in recent years, there were the opt-outs, as we call it. There was always major structural reforms, allowance for that. Now, an unusual event or severe economic downturn can trigger a, a relaxation of the rules or an opt-out. Now, um, <clears throat> the medium-term objectives, just to come back to them, these are defined in structural terms. That's the cyclically adjusted general government budget, net of one-offs, by the way, including bank, bank uh, capitalization, etc. Um, which is also equal to the structural deficit. And I hope you follow that. Um, they take a number of things into account. They, they, oh, sorry. They, they take debt levels. Uh, I'm going backwards here for some reason. Um, they take debt levels, ageing, and um, automatic stabilisers into account. They're supposed to provide a safety margin respect to the 3%, and they ensure rapid progress towards sustainability. I suppose that's the key uh, feature. Now... To quickly move on to the actual MTOs, because they've changed a bit. Pre the fiscal compact, there was a limit of minus one, which Michael Totty referred to earlier. But um, under the three, that limit is now essentially a half a percent. Uh, a deficit, you can have a most structural deficit of half a percent. Um, and that's if 
unless there's an up, you can, you can go a bit higher than that, i.e. minus one, if your debt, as we saw earlier, is very, in very good shape. But listen, Ireland, to get to Ireland, our medium term objective was traditionally a deficit of, a structural deficit of half a percent of GDP. But that has been, was changed in the 2013 uh, stability program update to zero. So now we're aiming at balance, which is a tougher constraint, reflecting our higher level of debt, I suppose, and the wisdom of whoever decided this, whether it was the Department of Finance or the Department of Finance and the EU or the Inter I don't know. But we certainly, that is now our, our deficit. Um, and just to give you a reference point for that, in 2005, from the earlier table, if you remember, uh, the structural deficit was 5%, and it only hits zero in 2018. Okay, I hope I'm not losing everybody at this stage. Um, so the size of the adjustment, uh, well, it's roughly, you move to it at half a percent per annum. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to say any more than that. That's enough, I think, confusion uh, for the moment. Let's come to the expenditure benchmark, which I said a moment ago is really the key new limit. Um, again, just a word on this, a slight bit of detail on this, if you don't mind. If you're at your medium-term objective, i.e. if your structural deficit is zero in 2018, then spending, and we'll define spending in a moment, can rise at the potential rate of GDP growth. That's calculated, just for the, for the nerds among you, as a 10-year average, five years, uh, four years history, the current year, five years forward, plus the GDP deflator of the year pre precedent. Right, but you needn't worry about that. It's basically potential growth plus GDP deflator. So it's sort of a nominal rate of growth of the economy. If you're not at your MTO, however, um, there is, you're not allowed to grow at that. You get a tighter constraint. Uh, a convergence margin is deducted. And here for Ireland, in 2014, for example, um, our potential GDP growth was around 0.6%. But we're not at the MTO, therefore a margin of 1.4 is deducted. So we can grow in real terms at z minus 0 0.7, a contraction of spending, and allow for the deflator, uh, which is around 1%. So we get a, a expenditure ceiling of just 0.3%. So I see some people nodding. I see other people looking bewildered. Um, but it basically... That, that minus 1.4 that they put in there is designed to contract expenditure and to get you towards deficit sustainability, i.e. a zero medium-term structural deficit. Now, um, a word on the definition. I said I'd come back to this of the expenditure since it is so important. It, it excludes a number of things. Debt interest, because you don't have any control over that, really. It excludes non-discretionary changes in unemployment, because if unemployment goes up or down, you really have to pay the social welfare. It excludes, um, if you spend the money that is fully matched by receipts from the EU, and there are programs in many countries, including Ireland, uh, of that nature. And investment expenditure, which is lumpy, or tends to be lumpy, is actually average, it's smoothed, right? So, next one. The rationale for all of that is quite simply, the focus on spending that is independent of the cycle, because you net out the cyclical elements of unemployment, it's within the government's control because you take out interest rates, interest expenditure. It has to be a bit of a tax revenue, as I said, you, if it is any this in and out spending, you, you get rid of it. And finally, you don't penalise investment fluctuations. So that's the rationale for the concept. It's obviously a smaller concept than total spending, but it's still pretty sizable. How am I doing time? Um, Here's an interesting thing I found in trawling through the literature in the Vada Makem. New governments, when they come in, uh, just a little statement of intent, a shot across the bows of, shall we say, the programs for the new government. You, remember, I'll read it. Member states, when preparing a first uh, stability program after a new government has taken office, are invited to show continuity with respect to the budgetary targets endorsed by Council on the basis of the previous stability program. So, so much for fiscal flexibility. Let's hope that the next election we don't have. There are already some worrying signs of people talking about tax cuts, by the way, when we can afford them. I'll show you in a minute. We won't be able to afford tax cuts for a long, long time. But, uh, but uh, you know, the, the big danger probably face, facing us now is an auction before the next election. Um, so uh, anyway, this is designed to avert that. Now, this slide, I 
know, it's a mixed view, it's not really accurate, is to give you an idea of how that expenditure rule might look in practice, but it's, it's a very imperfect slide. Because, it, first of all, I think spending as a percentage of GDP would be declining out to about 2018 or 2019, which is not really evident on that. But in principle, over the cycle, if you have expenditure growing in line with potential GDP, then you'll have a roughly constant level of expenditure. Now, the rules are complex, and that's not quite an accurate statement. But to give you an idea, that's the sort of an idea of the straitjacket that we may be heading into in the future. It's a, a, so it's a, it's a tougher regime. Now, I said earlier, a lot depends on growth. And I thought I'd put up a few forecasts here to show you. Now, here we have the first of that is the green. That's the Department of Finance base forecast from the Strategy for Growth document produced before Christmas. Some people said, you know, your nominal GDP gets up over 5%. And on that basis, I'll come to my last slide in a moment, on that basis, things work out for us reasonably well without the need for further austerity packages as we have become used to them, but with the need for certain austerity, which I'll define in a moment. Um, the department then put in a, a, an alternative to that, which was a high growth scenario. Uh, to be honest with you, it's hard to find the difference between the high and the low and the, the baseline one. <coughs> one is green and the other is red there. There's not much difference between them, so it probably was hardly worth the exercise worthwhile. Then I put in the DG ECFIN uh, forecast in their December uh, review of, of Ireland. They're in blue and they're lower. Um, and uh, you can see there, so in other words, under them, the task would be tougher. And there would be need for, you know, more strictures, shall we say. And finally, I put the yellow bars are the IMF, from, again, from their December document in Ireland. And they took a much more conservative approach. They're a good 1% below. So if, if that were to materialize, they, there would be greater strictures would be necessary post-2015. So let me come now, finally to that last slide again, and I'll try and explain to you what I'm talking about here. And it is that we went through the forecast underlying the Department of Finance document, right? So that's the reference point. Uh, they didn't, in their wisdom, include anything on spending or revenue. Uh, so I was forced to construct it myself, but it's fairly easy to do because you assume spending, you assume revenue grows in line with nominal GDP, GNP or GDP. And um, uh, since you've got the deficit, the spending falls out of it, right? So uh, when you do that, in addition to those various bits and pieces in that slide, you get a situation where expenditure, um, let me see how I'll put this, the cap ensures, expenditure first of all has to fall until about 2015, um, because it's part of the existing austerity programs, and it's part of getting the deficit down. So we will in the next budget have some revenue and some expenditure, even if it's not two billion. The government are looking for ways around that and they'll probably produce a few rabbits out of the hat. But um, after 2016, on the basis of these figures and the cap as defined earlier, expenditure could probably grow in nominal terms by roughly between one to one and a quarter percent on my figures, right? Now, some people say, isn't it terrific? Expenditure is growing. But I actually call that more austerity in a sense. And why do I do that? Well, because in prices are rising by more. And in real terms, spending is falling by anything from a quarter to 1% for the three years, 16, 17, and 18. That's how we get rid of the structural deficit. We curb spending. We have it growing at less than the rate of growth of potential GDP. What does that mean? It means percentage as, a per, as an ex, uh, expenditure as a percentage of GDP is declining a bit. And it also means that in real terms, spending is falling. So, I mean, that's, that's a reasonably tight uh, scenario. The interesting thing is that when you finally get to 2019 and 20, things change. On these forecasts, which have fairly large um, growth uh, projections in for those years, then expenditure can rise by more. And in fact, it, you get a situation then where expenditure could perhaps rise by 4%, and given inflation would be around 2 you're getting real increases in spending for the first time. So to synopsize, on those central forecasts, we will have a relatively very tight expenditure situation up until 2018. If we hit that target, we also hit the debt target and the budget targets. So that's why I say expenditure is paramount. Um, in, there is signs of easing then in, of slightly higher spending in 2019 and 20. 
Now, the alternative scenarios are, finally, I want to draw attention to them, and that is, what happens if growth is more or less than assumed in the department's central forecast? Um, I suppose it's fair to say that, you know, the, the expenditure strictures will be more or less, depending on that. That's how I put it. So you could see, uh, in extreme cases, expenditure, there is a bit of a lagged effect, a dampening effect. You could see expenditure being tighter by maybe half percent or a bit more, depending on how you work out the sums. It's very complicated, as I said earlier. But the net point is, uh, to finish, expenditure cap, very important. If we can manage, if we get reasonable growth and we hit the expenditure cap, then the 2015 will be the last budget in which we have packages of austerity, but the following three, 16, 17, and 18, will have spending, will have tax revenue unchanged in, as a percentage, or no change in taxes, net, but spending growing at a lower rate than prices, which is a tightish fiscal policy. There's one caveat to all of that, and that is um, you, the government, or Michael Noonan would probably say, well, I can increase spending as much as I like, and he can, but there is a caveat, and the caveat is provided he, he either cuts spending elsewhere to offset it, or he increases taxes. And an increase in tax would not be a pleasant prospect, I think, for, for most of us. Thank you.